Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to be here. That's the first time that I'm in an environment like that. So let's see. And uh, I hope that I can bring over my story to you, which is a little bit more scientific, probably. We go over to infectious diseases, especially to the influenza virus. And I, I think every one of you knows influenza viruses. Probably you have been infected at least once in your lifetime before. It's not a very pleasant disease, but usually you recover within a few weeks completely if you're uh, an adult that is otherwise healthy. This can be uh, completely different in the risk groups, which are very young people, children, small children, and the elderly. In the risk groups, this can lead to uh, intensive care treatment here and even to death. And uh, this is only the situation uh, regarding the seasonal flu, th so the yearly flu, which comes every winter. On top of that, influenza viruses have still another even more frightening dimension, and that is that flu viruses can cause pandemics. And the most devastating pandemic in the last century uh, was probably the Spanish flu pandemic in the winter of 1819 that has caused more than 40 million deaths worldwide. And uh, I think that the most impressive uh, figure that, that shows how, how severe that outbreak was is this curve of the life expectancy from 1900 uh, to 1960. And you can see that there is a vast drop here in the year 1819. And this is really due to the Spanish flu pandemic because during that pandemic, uh, young adults, otherwise, he otherwise healthy adults, uh, were killed by that virus. We faced more pandemics in the last century, uh, such as the Asian flu in 57 or the Hong Kong flu in 68. Besides these pandemics among humans, we also ha have faced some very unusual influenza viruses which jumped directly from birds to humans. And you probably still know the, the, the situation that started in 97 with the bird flu virus, the H5N1 viruses, and just only just recently, in January this year, we had a new bird flu virus coming up, the H7N9 subtype, that killed quite a lot of people already in, uh, in China. So that tells us that influenza viruses are always around us. Maybe someone of you, just in the moment, is infected has no signs of disease yet and spreads the virus inside here, which is not a very pleasant uh, idea to think it. So, but it, it can well be. So what can we do against this disease? Uh, there are actually two legs of intervention strategies to, to fight the flu. One option is vaccination and the other option uh, are antiviral drugs. And while I will mainly focus on this part, I have one slide which, uh, with which I want to stress the, the, the crucial role of vaccination. Uh, and I want to stress here that vaccination is still the best way to get protected from influenza. The flu vaccine is probably one of the best vaccines worldwide, but has a very bad reputation for whatever reason. But it's, I, I still can convince you that vaccination is a good option to get protected, at least for the seasonal influenza that comes up year by year. Nothing is 100% perfect, so there are also problems with these vaccines. For example, you need a new flu shot every year, and it's sometimes the vaccines are not efficient. You can even get infected if you are vaccinated. And uh, But the most, the most important point which I want to stress here is that vaccination is not an option for the early phase of an influenza pandemic. In the case of an influenza pandemic, you have a new virus that comes up where no vaccine is available yet. So uh, a new vaccine has to be produced and this needs four to six months in, in any case. So uh, you have a four to six months period where the, there's no coverage by vaccination and a severe virus can do a lot of harm in that period of time. So we need antiviral drugs, especially for that situation, but also for, for uh, the seasonal flu. What are uh, our current 
uh, options for, for antiviral drugs here. Basically, uh, the arsenal is quite limited. We have two families of antiviral drugs against the flu. Uh, one family are the so-called M2 ion channel blockers. I'll tell you in the min minute what that is. They are uh, known as amantadine and remantadine. These are the brand names. And uh, the other group are the neuraminidase inhibitors. And uh, you probably all know Tamiflu, Oseltamivir, and uh, its brother Relanza. These are uh, neuraminidase inhibitors. Um, these are still, uh, you can still get it in the pharmacy, and these can, uh, they, they are still effective. However, uh, we, we get a, a rising problem here, and that is the problem of resistance. And this problem of resistance comes through the mode of action of these drugs. And uh, to, to tell you how this works, is this, this is a, a virus particle, a sketch of a virus particle. You do not need to know what all these different points are. What is important here is that the M2 ion channel blockers, they block this grayish channel here in the, oops, in the virus particle by simply sitting in the channel and, and don't allow exchange through that channel. And that, uh, it simply says that the virus only has to mutate on certain positions to get a resistant variant. And this happened in the past quite frequently. And uh, we have the situation now that uh, the Center of Diseases Control in the United States does not recommend the use of amantadine and remantadine anymore because mainly all virus strains are, are uh, resistant. This is much better with the neuraminidase inhibitors uh, such as Tamiflu, they block this yellow structure here on the virus surface, and this structure has a function. This structure uh, is needed to release the virus from uh, the infected cell, to release new particles from the cell. So um, the idea was, if we block that function, then a virus that gets resistant should be less fit, should be less well uh, able to replicate. But nature, uh, like always is more clever than drug developers. And so the, the virus has, has found its way to create resistant variants that are, uh, are equally fit as normal viruses, also under the pressure of tummy flu. So we see the era of tummy flu re really ending because more and more viruses get resistant. And that means that we basically have nothing in hands to fight the flu in, in maybe some few years. So we urgently need uh, new viruses, so the, the problem that exists here, that drugs that directly target the virus particle uh, leads to rapid induction for, of resistant variants, and therefore we urgently need a new strategy here. We need new antivirals that should be widely available, that should be broadly active also against new and upcoming virus strains, and they should not develop resistance because if you then develop them, you can use them for years and years and, and have no uh, resistance phenomenon. So how can we develop such a strategy? And at this point, I want to step back a little and uh, tell you a little bit about my education, uh, uh, about my, uh, my scientific career. Actually, I did my PhD in virology, and after that, I decided to, to switch the field uh, and, and go to the field uh, of cell biology, because in the days of my, my virology education, uh, there was always a lack of gain of knowledge what the cellular side of virus replication is. And I should stress here that uh, the, the important thing that distinguishes viruses from bacteria or parasites is that viruses need cells to replicate. They need cells of your body. Flu virus needs cells in your lung to replicate. A virus is not a, a living being. They, they only live by infecting cells and replicating there. And uh, there was a really a lack of knowledge what the cellular counterpart of the virus replication is. So I, I moved in that days to a field where cell biology is more important. And uh, this was actually the cancer research field. And uh, especially I was interested in the molecular um, uh, causes of cancer, with this act which is actually a change in intracellular signal transduction in a way. And now I'm, I'm really in a problem here. How can I explain to you signal transduction and what does it mean? What is cellular signal transduction? I tried it with this figure, but probably this is not the best way. So. 
I, let's, let's take an example. Let's take these people here in the first row. Audience participation time. <laughs> uh, and let's assume you would not sit here. Uh, let's assume you would be fenced, uh, 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 surrounded by a fence. And then someone from that door comes in and approaches you, here the first guy in, in, in that line, makes himself uh, to pay you attention and whispers you in uh, the ear, uh, please tell all the others by whispering them in the ear that the last guy in that row should stand up and turn three times in circles. What happens is that you start to move within that fence. And we can now say that fence is the cell membrane. And the guy from the outside is an extracellular agent, like a growth factor, which moves around the body and uh, is needed for cell communication. And he, that guy coming from the outside makes you move inside the cell. And you tell your neighbor, please tell your other neighbor, and, and so on, un until you then started to move. So the signal is actually not visible because you cannot see the signal. What you can see is that people inside here, that fence, so proteins in a cell, start to move, start to, uh, to uh, behave and communicate with each other to make the cell react. And this is actually the whole uh, idea of signal transduction. That's how cells communicate with this, uh, which is other th so these, these uh, factors inside here are actually you, the, the proteins that communicate within the cell, uh, leading to a cellular reaction. So knowing this, are you still with me? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> knowing this, it's easy to understand how disease occurs in a cell on a cellular level. Because you know these chains by speaking to one, uh, whispering to one's ears in, in these rows. Things go wrong. Sometimes you, uh, the, the information starting here will not end in the right way here. And maybe he's told then that you should turn around 300 times, not 30. And this will make you sick, I, I, I swear. So that's how a misled signal transduction leads to disease. And actually, uh, this happens, it's rather dark, but this happens in a situation like cancer. You have a misled signal transduction here, which is not controlled anymore. and you have then uh, these, these misled signal transduction leads to unlimited growth. And the idea of, of all the cancer researchers is that they would like to develop anti-cancer drugs that block these misled factors in the cell and thereby uh, block the unlimited growth. That in our example, that would mean I take out one of you uh, and then the, the misled uh, information isn't transferred anymore. So while working on this, so I worked in this field uh, quite a while, uh, and again, in our example, that would mean I, I would like to know who of you got nuts and gives the wrong information, uh, and, and why uh, you do that. Um, and uh, at this point, I stepped back and I thought, okay, this misled communication, this is something which occurs in cancer, but it's the same thing in, in cells uh, that uh, then leads to uh, uh, the replication of the virus, so the, the cell is reprogrammed. So now from that different perspective, looking from the cell to the virus, we can uh, see that the virus not only infects the cell and replicates, but this is promoted by intracellular signal transduction events. And at uh, this point, uh, you could think of blocking these intracellular signal transduction events that is induced by the virus and not in the neighboring cells which are not infected and thereby block virus replication. And to cut a long story short here, we were uh, indeed able to identify these misled factors in the uh, infected cell. And there are two critical factors here, and I do not want to go into deep uh, what that means, but one is a kinase called MEC. This is the abbreviation, and the other factor is NF kappa B, uh, an, a, a factor that controls virus replication inside the cell. And what happens if the cell is infected? The virus brings in this red virus components, uh, brings it to the nucleus of the cell where it replicates, and uh, 
at the same time, the virus induces signaling, and this signaling events helps these viral components, to the newly produced components, to leave the nucleus again to be packaged in the virions. And if we then block this signaling, that means not blocking the virus directly, but indirectly blocking the factors which are required for, for replication, either by an nf kappa b inhibitor or by a MEK-inhibiting agent, we could block virus replication. But most importantly, uh, if you remember what I said in the beginning uh, concerning the, the, these uh, resistance phenomena, uh, most importantly, this indirect blocking of the signal effectors does not lead to the formation of resistance uh, in, in the virus population. And this is done here in uh, this experiment. Uh, these bars, these black bars, show viruses that grow without any inhibition. So they grow to 100%. And if we add in the inhibitors, either the nf kappa b blocker that blocks the cellular uh, component or oseltamivir as an inhibitor that blocks the virus directly, <coughs> we can see that in the, in the first inhibition round, they both work very effectively, also uh, in, a, in a second round. But then, all of a sudden, we see the white bar coming up. And at the seventh or eighth uh, treatment round, the bar is as high as the control bar. And this means that the viruses which were treated with olzatamivir are completely resistant, whereas this did not happen with the nf kappa b blocking agent. And uh, this is the great advantage of this, um, of this uh, indirect blockade of, of cellular uh, factors. So to wrap up, I hope I could convince you that we can, by this new perspective, not focusing on the virus, but looking from the cellular side on the uh, virus, we can find new strategies and, and actually a paradigm change in anti-influenza therapy, blocking cellular factors and cellular signaling factors rather than the virus itself. And uh, we have identified two of these cellular factors which are important here, that's the kinase MEK or the factor nf kappa b They efficiently block uh, if, if we inhibit them, they efficiently block influenza virus uh, growth in cell culture and also in animals. You can really rescue lethally infected animals with these drugs uh, without toxic side effects or the tendency to, to induce resistance. Uh, we know already the, the mode of action. I've, sh I've shown you this, uh, this slide there. This is very important in a drug development scheme. And uh, the good thing is also that Several drugs are already in clinical uh, testing or clinical use that inhibit these particular factors for other indications such as cancer or uh, inflammatory diseases. So that uh, tells us we can easily take these compounds which are already well tolerated in, in patients and uh, use it for this second application, namely the antiviral application. Okay, where do we stand? We have a first clinical trial for flu therapy that has started in uh, January. We'll see in, in autumn uh, what, uh, how this works out. And for the MAC story, we're still seeking for partnering, so you're invited to help us. Thank you very much.